This lecture is going to be about the Kronig Penny model. This is a model that I personally dislike. Uh, and, and there's nothing really wrong with it except that it can't be applied to anything that is real. It's, uh, you can't use this model to create you know, the uh, band structure of silicon, for example. Uh, and, you know, for me personally, I'm an engineer, and I like quantum, but everything in quantum that I like is something that I can see an application for. Uh, this, nonetheless, I think is an instructive model, and it helps demonstrate the origin of uh, electron bands. Uh, in the previous lecture, we saw how uh, you can get band gaps that open up in the uh, tight binding model, and this is due to the tight binding model uh, being uh, applied within uh, Bloch's theorem. So you can have uh, this kind of offset as you... Uh, it has to do with the translation of, of space and the fact that when you translate space, you add a phase factor to the uh, wave function. Uh, in this model, this model is about how uh, having periodic barriers can also lead to uh, band gaps. <clears throat> so, let's get into it now. This is the Kronig Penny model. And uh, the Basic concept is we're going to create a potential field. Uh, this is going to be, again, a one-dimensional model. And in our one-dimensional model, we're going to have uh, a potential, U, X, and we're going to define barriers that pop up ever so often and it goes on infinitum. Uh, that's going to be negative B, zero, A. So our periodicity is going to be a plus B is the length of the period. Uh, the barriers, the, the potential in here is zero, so it's similar to a free electron, and we're going to call this region one. Uh, this region we're going to call re region two, and we have a, a finite size potential well, and we're saying this is U zero as our point, and then this region we'll call region 3, and again it has zero potential. So what we're essentially solving are uh, two uh, sets of problems. Well, we can divide this into two regions of space. <clears throat> One region of space, we have a uh, free electron. So the zero potential, and we're solving minus h bar squared over to m the second derivative with respect to position of psi is equal to e psi. So that's going to be the free electron region. And then in region two, we're solving negative h bar squared over two m d squared dx squared plus u sub zero psi is equal to e psi. So we've added in a potential energy term. <clears throat> and solving these we have two uh, 
differential equations with second order uh, derivatives. That means we need four boundary conditions, and those boundaries are going to be defined <coughs> here and here. So one boundary is between region one and region two. So we say that the C boundary conditions are that psi in region one at zero is equal to psi at region two at zero, because the wave function must be continuous. Also, the slope of the wave function must be continuous as well. So d dx psi one at zero is equal to d by dx psi two at zero. And then the other boundary is gonna be leaving region two, or it's equivalent to this boundary, but we only need to express it once because of the periodicity. And that is the continuity psi at two at minus b is equal to psi in region three at minus b and continuous derivatives d by dx, not continuous, but uh, 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 I guess continuous second derivatives <laughs> at two negative b is equal to d by dx psi region three at negative b. So this keeps uh, the wave function continuous and smooth everywhere. <clears throat> okay, let's solve region one. I'll pick a different color marker. Got a purple one this time. Open up a new a new pack of mark markers. Okay, let's call this a. Region one. Negative h bar squared over two m d dx squared squared psi is equal to e psi. We know the answer, it's free electrons. It gives us psi x is equal to a e to the i alpha x plus b e to the minus i alpha x. Okay, and these coefficients, we're going to have to uh, use the boundary conditions to find those. And next, we'll solve region 2, and I'll grab a blue marker for that. So region two, we have uh, negative h bar squared. Let's see if we have enough space for this. <clears throat> negative h bar squared over two m d squared dx squared plus u naught psi is equal to e psi. Now, there's two, uh, there's actually two uh, regimes for this solution. One regime, and I'll, I'll draw over right here, uh, one regime is where the energy is larger than u naught, and basically we're talking about a wave that's coming in, and then when it reaches this barrier, it's going to go through and it's also going to scatter. So that's... Uh, uh, an unbounded region. The second is when E is less than U naught, and this is the bounded solution because we're bounding the uh, electron inside of these wells, and that's what we have in the case of uh, uh, atoms. You know, we can have uh, electrons that are being transmitted through the material, 
but uh, most of the time we're talking about bonding and we're talking about uh, electrons that are bound to the nucleus. And in that case, we've got a wave function which comes in and when it reaches this barrier, there's some exponential decay. So the solution to uh, that region is psi is equal to C e to the beta x plus d e to the minus beta x. So those are the solutions for uh, decay. So we don't have the uh, uh, imaginary sign in there because we have a de decay and then in this case with the imaginaries we just have uh, uh, sine and uh, cosine. And then lastly, we need a solution here in, in region 3, which is also region 1. And let's uh, write that in orange. Okay, E has that would be a good choice, but uh, let's call this, uh, well, I don't want to mess with my notes too much. Uh, let's call this script E. I'm going to make that a, a script E, E to the I gamma X, F E to the minus I gamma X. <clears throat> don't worry, that script E is going to go away. Uh, fairly quickly. Okay. Now, dealing with that, uh, what we're going to do also is that uh, we're going to be thinking about this not in terms of a solution in region 3, but we're going to treat it as a solution in region 1 in which we apply Bloch's theorem. So whenever we get over to our application of the boundary conditions, uh, we're going to be simply using that uh, psi 1 at A is equal to psi 3 at minus B e to the i k d, right, find this, d is equal to a plus b, so that's going to be our periodicity. Uh, or we could also write this as psi 3 at minus b is equal to psi 1 at a e to the minus i k d. Okay, so if we take and apply our boundary conditions <clears throat> to the solutions, uh, we get, and I'm going to erase Picture here. Uh, the applied boundary conditions give us I'm going to label these one, two, three, four. We get A plus B is equal to C plus D. This is after I substitute and I, I uh, uh, divide through by terms. So I, I've done the simplification in the notes. Uh, 2 gives us I alpha A 
minus I alpha B is equal to beta C minus beta D. Condition three gives us C E to the beta minus B plus D E to the beta B is equal to E to the I K D. And I have to erase this as well, apparently. Um, sorry, E to the minus minus I K D because I'm using uh, this boundary condition where I'm substituting in uh, psi 1 in for the solution for psi 3. So, yeah, that's psi 1, that's psi 2. <clears throat> uh, in for psi 3, A, E to the I alpha, A plus B, E to the minus I, alpha a. So you can see here how useful this blocks function is to allow us to uh, fold solutions uh, back in. And boundary condition 4 gives us i alpha a <coughs> e to the i alpha a minus i alpha b e to the minus i alpha a is equal to e to the i k d beta c e to the minus beta b minus beta d e to the beta b. Okay, so we get our four uh, uh, equations from applying the boundary conditions and we can now take and rearrange these into a matrix, right? Because what we're actually looking for is we're looking for solutions to these coefficients. So let's apply a little bit of algebra Turn these into one, one, minus one, minus one, I alpha minus I alpha minus beta plus beta. E to the I alpha A, E to the minus I alpha A, minus E to the I K D minus beta B, minus E to the I K D plus beta B, I alpha e to the I alpha a minus I alpha e to the minus I alpha a minus beta e to the I k d minus beta b plus beta e to the I K D plus beta B. Times A B C D equals 
zero, 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 zero. <clears throat> okay. And that's our, our problem to solve. So we get the non-trivial solution by taking the determinant of this and setting it equal to zero. And you can do that uh, you know, with any number of mathematical software packages. If you want to do it by hand, there's this called this method by minors, in which you basically take your larger matrix and you break it up into minors. You saw that probably in your linear algebra class if you had one when you were a youngster. Uh, if not, it's easy to pick up. It's even easier to, to put it in Mathematica and get the answer. Uh, so let me write out the solution we get solving this. So the solution is beta squared minus alpha squared over 2 alpha beta. I just need those parentheses to it. Hyperbolic sine beta b sine alpha a plus hyperbolic cosine of beta b cosine of alpha a is equal to cosine of k d. Okay, uh, so this kind of mathematical side note, remember I showed you that the sine and the cosine are related to uh, e to the i, e to the i, so sine theta, cosine theta are related to e to the i uh, theta. Uh, there are hyperbolic sines and cosines are related to e, uh, uh, e to the theta. So it's a, a, a series of these uh, uh, terms without the uh, imaginary. Again, it's something that you can do this longhand or in Mathematica the command full simplify and uh, you can also have this I think as a trig uh, to exp uh, substitution as well uh, command that will automatically do all of this for you uh, and give you this nice compact form. Okay. So we've got this, and it's not particularly useful right now. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to take our model, and we're going to take this uh, uh, opening, which goes from minus b to 0, and we're going to convert that into a Dirac delta. So a Dirac delta is a function that has uh, It's infinitely thin and uh, infinitely tall. And if you integrate a Dirac delta, it has the value of 1. Okay, so basically doing that, we're saying that b goes to 0 and u0 goes to infinity. Well, there's no u0 in our solution, but we do have b's that have to go to uh, 0. Uh, and you can take, again, use numerical software, take limits, or 
uh, go through and uh, perform this term by term. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we wind up with is There's just a bunch of things up in the top. Don't worry about that. There's those are just uh, alphas and betas. Uh, and in fact, this entire function is really sorry, not function. This entire first term is uh, unimportant because what we're going to do is we've got this, and this problem is unsolvable. Uh, it's it's a transcendental function. can't in invert it to uh, solve for uh, this coefficient or anything, but what we can do is we can graphically interpret the results. And, and in this case, the graphical interpretation is, is going to be not that difficult because our interpretation comes about from looking at this uh, right-hand side. So this right-hand side, if you look at it, you look at it, it's going to do this. And it doesn't matter what you pick for k or for a, it's going to be bound from plus 1 to minus 1 because it's a cosine function. So what that means is it means that our right-hand side must be must be bound between uh, minus 1 to plus 1. And we have something that goes as 1 over alpha a So if we are plotting alpha a, we have something which is going to do this. Okay? And then bounding that solution Between plus one, minus one, tells us that we have a solution that exists. Between here and here, between here and here, between here and here, here onward. And in this region, we have forbidden
But if we go back, if we go back to our eigenvalues, which I cleverly didn't write here, uh, but our eigenfunctions give us that the energy goes as h bar squared over 2m alpha squared, and we've got an alpha here. So this is essentially the energy. So what we're getting is we're getting in our energy space regions where there's a solution and regions where the solutions are forbidden. And this is going to translate into a band gap, or bands and band gap, so on and so forth. So this chronic penny model demonstrates how bands and bands gap, bands and band gaps originate uh, through the application of uh, very small perturbations that are being applied to a free electron, it's basically a free electron, that's moving through a, a lattice of these uh, disruptions. And it's also worth pointing out that in order for this band gap to open up, it relies upon the those tiny perturbations, because that is a very small perturbation, uh, for those tiny perturbations to be periodically arranged. So the reason that we get bands and band gaps, they come directly about from the application of translational symmetry, which then gives us Bloch's theorem, which allows us to solve and get uh, these bands and band gaps.